Awesome. So guys, everybody, we have um, Ted Akas today here in the Simon G Show. Um, most percussionists would know who Ted is. For those of you who are not percussionists, Ted uh, famously uh, had a job with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra until 2006. And then he left his job to play with his rock band, uh, Nyko. He's the lead man, founder of Nyko, uh, one of the two founders of Nyko. Then he went on to have, um, he has had a really diverse career. Uh, currently, he's uh, in the faculty at the Bob Cole um, Conservatory at California State, uh, Long Beach. Uh, he's also in the faculty at Lynn University, Colborn. And he lives a multifaceted career. He's, you know, placed with different studios. So um, anyways, and he was one of my teachers in undergrad. He's probably uh, the reason I'm doing this orchestral thing. So Ted, thanks for joining us. Always nice to see you. Thanks for having me, Simon. So you're saying all of this is my fault? That your, your orchestral career is all my fault? You can blame it on me? <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I went this thing. So, I mean, I guess maybe since we're going that way, we should give people a little bit of context, right? So I was a junior in, junior at the University of Miami, studying with Nate Rosario. This was 2006, I believe, or seven, yeah. 2006 or seven. So you had just um, left your job in Chicago, and then I was just, you know, studying percussion in Miami, studying with Nate. I wanted to play marimba, and then you come along, you know. You're like, yeah, you know, you should do this snare drum thing. So you should take these um, summer festival auditions and see what happens, you know. You, you kind of give me a little nudge to, to, to taste your orchestral world. And, you know, I, I, you know, I actually, we're joking. I don't blame, like, it's been a wonderful time. And I'm so glad I, I came into you, your stop in my education. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess let's go back to 2006. I, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily want to go back then, but, you know, it's inevitable. We're interviewing Ted Aka, so we have to, 2006, uh, you know, I cannot believe this is already 14 years ago, but you know, you had this job and then you, here you come. I still remember when you came to University of Miami, it's one day, you know, you, you look young, you have this rock star, you know, persona and you're coming in and he's like, yeah, guys, let's do some orchestral percussion. Let's do a class, right? So why the hell were you thinking in 2006? You know, let's get yeah, into like, it. Yeah, like you're going, what, who is this guy? What's he doing here? And yeah. Well, first of all, the, as you were talking, I was thinking about when you demonstrated to me what you were doing on snare drum, you guys were doing this thing where, where both snare drum sticks would hit the drum at the same time. <laughs> and I thought I'd never seen that before. I mean, it kind of works yes. on a practice pad, but on a drum, it's like that sound. It's almost like the, the sound that you get when you get two cymbals, like to get a perfect air pocket. It's like the, <laughs> the worst sound. But, you yes. know, that's what you guys were doing. And, and uh, you know, and so... Obviously, I was doing something different. That that particular time uh, was a real transitional time for me because um, I think I just left the orchestra, um, but I was doing a one year uh, for Nay Rosaro, who was who was taking a sabbatical, and um, that was a great year because I I met some some great players like you, um, but yeah, at that time you were not you were not doing the orchestral thing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and, uh, and yeah, but you, you quickly got interested in it and, and got involved in it. Um, so I really enjoyed coming down to university of Miami, but yeah, that was, I think that was right about the time we were, my wife and I, we weren't married yet, but we were deciding whether or not we would move. Uh, we were thinking about moving out to LA. Um, but yeah, that was about the time when I, when I quit the orchestra and I was pretty much as free as, as I'd been since you know before i went to college and yeah i was i was touring with my band and we were doing weekend warrior type dates in which we would get in the van and we'd pack the trailer with all of our gear uh and we would drive up to like places like upper peninsula of michigan which is a hey nice uh what yeah. is that a cat is that your cat good oh yeah Miller. it's good stuff oh, nice yeah nice yeah yeah. And so anyway, yeah, we were we were we were weekend warriors and we would drive up and we'd have some really incredible shows. And at that time, you could still sell CDs. 
So, you know, sometimes we'd sell like 50 CDs at a show and we'd be like, yeah, we've got gas money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was that it was like being it was like being 21 again and being in a rock band and, and trying to make it. So, yeah, yeah the, the, the problem, I guess, is that I did everything in the wrong order. You know, I think you're supposed to do that crazy, like go on the road with your band before you get into the orchestra, um, except for the fact that, you know, we all know that if you're going to be an orchestral musician, you better start early and, and dedicate mm -hmm. all of your energies to it. Yeah. Here we go. Hey, Ted. Is it better? Gentlemen and ladies, I'm, I'm very sorry, but uh, obviously this is, uh, this is called quarantine parenting. That's right. I no, I really appreciate you you um you know joining us because actually, you know, somebody this has been a question for many of my guests. So I, I had Shannon recently, I had Matt. They all have families, right? And yeah. so some of my friends are like, Can you ask these people how they manage to have a career? And hopefully we'll get there because now your career is like you're running taps, you got three teaching jobs, you're playing film scores in LA all, all over the place. I'm I don't know what else, you, like you're probably doing so many art, you're writing your pop songs, you know, you're, so it's really cool, man, so. Yeah, man, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Matt, Matt Strauss and I have, we, we have plenty of conversations about this because we both have young families and, um, you know, Matt's, Matt's been uh, through, I think, two floods in Houston and right. rebuilding his house and, and we just moved and yeah, life is, uh, you know, life presents many challenges, um, but certainly, uh, mm -hmm. you know, very, very grateful right now given the state of affairs, um, give, given yeah. the state of affairs in, you know, as it pertains to the pandemic, as it pertains to, um, you know, people that are people that are feeling very oppressed in this country, um, mm -hmm. people that are not able to get in or out of this country. I mean, I could, I could go into all that. So I'm certainly not complaining. And, uh, but yeah, it's, <laughs> I think we're all, uh, yeah. yeah, no, what you were saying, it's like, so true, but actually let's stay on this topic for a little bit because you were really quick to move to these virtual interviews with some of the best percussionists in the country, right? Uh, how, how do you decide that? When do you decide to go into, okay, we're going virtual for TAPS? Like, what was the reasoning behind that? Yeah, I think um, it, was, it was clear to me that uh, we needed to, to make sure that we were, were staying connected. Um, I also was trying to figure out ways to keep my students inspired at the schools at which I teach. And so it made perfect sense uh, to, to work through my nonprofit taps to, to invite people to come in and, and be interviewed. Um, you know, that's exactly one of the reasons that I started taps was, you know, I, I wanted to, I wanted to reach people that we weren't ordinarily going to. Uh, and this was a way to reach those people, but also provide something for my students who were also stuck at home. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that, you know, we're, we're already seeing some of the, you know, some of the, the pitfalls of trying to do this from home, you know, over the last five minutes. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I, you know, playing you know, with zoom doing like playing lessons, I found that to be really difficult. Um, but the interviews like the one, you know, the ones you're doing, I think this is, this is a great way to connect and you end up talking about things that, that you wouldn't necessarily talk about in a lesson because in a lesson you get right into the playing portion of things. Mm -hmm. And here, you know, I started interviewing people and friends of mine like Matt Strauss and Tom Sherwood, people that I'd known for 20 or 30 years were saying stuff that I'd never heard them say before. So yeah. it was, it was interesting to me. And uh, I was thinking, okay, this is, this is cool, but yeah, it's been, it's been really enlightening and uh, rewarding, especially when, you know, if you're home every day, I think all of us are kind of going, all right, how do we structure our day? How do we be productive? And some days are long and some days are depressing and, you know, just trying to figure out uh, finding some uh, structure to the day. And that's what those interviews provided. Right. And, and, and there's always the, you know, what's, what's next uh, thinking. And I actually think I was only able to catch one of the interviews. Usually they were around the time I had to teach. But I mean, I agree with the sentiment. It was like inspiring. I mean, you were inspiring. Uh, you're interviewing Tom Freer, right? And actually, it's kind of fascinating because we live in this world where like, you know, they have been for many years, there have been this like kind of uh, trait, like traits of, you know, some some schools, right? So so it's the Philadelphia and then the Cleveland and stuff. But you're talking to these people and you can get great ideas from all of them, right? And 
to get inspiration like the time period class i was like oh my god i need to go practice and put in the clock <laughs> yeah. you know to 10 minutes is the intensity yeah. is, is, is definitely something we need and i actually think you have done a great job because you have this skill that i think also is connected to teaching right where it's like you are a good public speaker you're a good presenter so i guess let's go back to those years in college where you were actually interested in teaching right that was your background like you that's kind of what you were trying to do so you were telling us what was the thing that made you go into the orchestral thing yeah right thank you for getting me back on track yeah. um you know by the way i, I don't i don't know for certain that i that i wanted to be a, a like a band high school band director mm -hmm. i think i was just I, I think i was going through the motions in in a lot of ways yes. um in terms of you know i decided to be a music ed and performance, I, I was started as performance major and went in as a double major after my junior year. Cause first of all, I was like, okay, I don't, I don't think I can be a performer a, and then B wow, schools, college went by really quick. I mean, I was having a lot of fun in college, you know, just growing up and learning about who I was and, and meeting all sorts of people. And so doing a double major got me a fifth year at BU uh, with, with scholarship. So I was sort of, you know, working the system and, and buying myself some time and Tom Geiger was my teacher. And for those of you that don't know who Tom Geiger is, you probably know his bass drum mallets, but he was a tremendous player uh, in the Boston Symphony. And he was a great teacher. He was a very compassionate guy. And he was, um, he was not like a ball buster in mm -hmm. any way. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of let me slide a bit, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, a lot of times my lessons were I'd bring in like my, my cassette player with a recording of like Brahms one, I said, okay, I'm going to play through the timpani book. And then, you know, he'd kind of say, now, Ted, that's not very good. And, you know, but he wasn't like chewing me out saying you had to practice more. Anyway, when I decided to become a, a music ed major as well as performance, and I told him this, he said, oh, I'm really disappointed. <laughs> and I said, really, why? And he said, well, I thought you could be a performer. I thought you, I think you have what it takes. And I'm thinking, well, why didn't you tell me that and kick my ass, you know, when I was a freshman, so I started working at it. Um, but even after he said that, you know, that was nice to hear, but I still thought, nah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this. So, but I, so I get my, my degree and I didn't work very hard to get a, a teaching gig, but I fell upon this gig teaching in Worcester, Massachusetts, which mm. is about 50 or 60 miles outside of Boston where I lived. And I drove out there and I was basically what they called a full-time substitute teacher. And I think it paid $85 a day and that didn't include gas or anything. And, um, you know, it was rough, man. You know, I had to wake up at about five and then I would, you know, teach all day and I'd go to a different classroom every 45 minutes and it was kindergarten through sixth grade. And some of the, it was a different school every day. So I got to every classroom once every two weeks huh. and no one said like okay here's your curriculum so i had to write a curriculum which was basically me going in with a guitar and percussion instruments and and playing songs and singing and um and after every day i i had a pack of smokes that i smoked on the way back to and from worcester and i played music loudly and uh just thought I got to do something with my life. Hmm. You know, this is, this is not, this is not my life um, for in the future. I, I can't do this another year. I mean, it was really grueling by the way, I, to make ends meet, I was going and telemarketing for the Boston symphony. So yeah. I was for, yes. For, so five thirty to nine thirty, I was on the phone, like hawking subscriptions <laughs> for the Boston symphony. Wow. So yeah, it was a, it was a rough year, but it was like, it was important because it's when I realized I had to do something with my life. And so that's when I applied to uh, NEC and San Francisco Conservatory and um, where else? I think uh, BU mm. and uh, Juilliard or something like that. Mm. And I decided to go to NEC for my master's. And my thinking at that time was, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to try and become a professional musician. And if I fail, I won't have any regrets about it. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the main impetus for it. And I was really lucky because the only thing I knew about NEC was that it was, it, it had a good reputation as a music conservatory and it was the best one in Boston where I liked living. Mm. What I didn't know was that uh, Will Hudgens had just started teaching there two mm. years earlier uh, and that he was basically going to be the new 
guru for, mm -hmm. for teaching people how to get win jobs. Yeah. Um, and so if not for will, you know, I, I definitely would not have, have gotten as far as I did as quickly as I did, but will showed me the ropes, you know, what the excerpts were, what they were supposed to sound like, what the necessary level was, how to practice, how to, you know, hear, uh, detailed elements of rhythm mm -hmm. and phrasing and time and feel and all the things that are critical to, to performing this stuff at a, at a high level for an audition. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. So I, it seems like we were both pretty lucky in terms of running into great teachers. I mean, including you, for me, it was me, you, and then I, I had Matt. And so then you had Will and then you had Mr. Abel, if I'm not wrong. Yep. When I, when I finished studying with Will, um, I, I applied to uh, Juilliard and I applied to Temple for, for like a postmaster's, you know, professional certificate, I think is what Temple called it. And Will said, man, if you get in to study with Al, you got to go study with Al. Yeah. Can't turn him down. Yeah. And so I remember this because uh, Roland Koloff, uh, may he rest in peace, he called me up at Juilliard, which was a place that you know, if you grow up in New York City and your parents are like supportive of what you do, they're like, they'd love to say, oh, my child goes to Juilliard. And, and so, you know, I got into Juilliard. Roland Koloff calls me up and he says, you know, I'd like you to come to Juilliard. Mm. And I told him that I'd already committed to Temple. And, and uh, you know, he kind of, he hung up on me. Okay. Um, but I'll tell you, I, you know, I loved studying with Roland. I took some lessons with him. Yeah. Uh, but Alan Abel was was the game changer. Uh, let's call Will Hudgens the game changer, and, and Alan was the finisher. Hmm. Um, Alan taught me how to think. Alan taught me how to how to really be diligent about my practice, how to practice the right way. Um, yeah, he 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 taught me how to be organized, uh, how to be detail oriented in in the way that I approached preparing, hmm. um, not only auditions but music. Um, Alan. His success, I think, is mostly predicated on, on the fact that he was a very, very deep musician. That combined with the fact that he cared deeply about every one of his students and about imparting his, his wisdom. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite amazing what kind of legacy he left. You know, all of you guys, so many of my teachers studied with Mr. Abel. And uh, yeah, it sounds like you, you definitely, you got the game changer and will. And then uh, I'll refine you and give you extra tips. But where did this utter conviction that you have with your playing? You know, every time, you know, you, it's in the New York Times article, but it makes sense. Every time I saw you, maybe that's why you had such an impression on me when you came to Miami. And then, you know, playing with the CSO, you, when you play with a group like that, you have to be with, like, play with utter conviction. Like, a percussionist from town say, like, you know, Ted has cojones, you know, like, where do you get that? Like, do you always <laughs> had it or like you just kind of develop it? Well, man, I, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think, I think that uh, that's interesting because I, I think there's a duality to, to this idea that someone, you know, has a lot of guts. I mean, toughness is, is uh, combined with a great deal of fear. <laughs> okay. And, and fear is a great motivator. Um, but I think, you know, maybe growing up in New York, um, you know, may, maybe you have to, you know, I, I, I grew up, I wouldn't say I grew up in a really tough neighborhood, but going to school, um, you know, I saw some things and, and, and got beat up enough times and gotten fights. And um, I don't know, does that contribute? I, I think, I think what you end up doing as a musician is, you know, like the only way to play music is, is play it with conviction and play it with passion. And we've all been, we've all seen or maybe been, been witness or, been a part of it ourselves when we're doing something and we're, our heart is not fully in it. And, uh, you know, in, with anything we do, if, if our heart's not in it, it's, yeah. it's not going to be, it's not going to be the best product. Um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I, I, I figured out how to, how to make this stuff that I was preparing mine and how to, how to do it in a way that it felt personal. And, and I always wanted to try and say something that was, that was mine. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was as simple as like, okay, I, I, this one, I'm just going to lay down with, with really great time. And, and it's going to be about the times. And, and sometimes more, 
preparing this stuff, you know, it's finding what is that, what is that special sauce that you're trying to, to bring to this thing. Um, but as far as playing with conviction, you know, I, I don't know exactly where that comes from, but I guess one thing I'm realizing as I get older is that I've always been really into music. You know, I've always, as a kid, I was always singing and, and into music and I happened to find the drums as, as the outlet. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess like it, it, to me, it's a crime to like try and be a musician and, and get into music and not be passionate about, about what you're doing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, no. but, but certainly, you know, you definitely got to fake it till you make it. And sometimes there's, there, you know, like, for example, I've been in situations where you get thrown apart. Um, uh, and I'll give you an example of this. Um, at, in Chicago, we were doing the, this is my first year in the orchestra, and we were doing the Ligeti Piano Concerto. Hmm. Do you know that one? Yeah, yeah, talk Silo Lake. Yeah. It's a it's a total bitch, all right. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, Patsy Dash was assigned the part, and um, she the, she on Tuesday she played the rehearsal, and then Tuesday afternoon she fell ill, and she called in sick for the rest of the week. And so Gordon Peters, who was the principal uh, at that time, because I started as uh, in the section, Gordon let me know that I was going to play that part. Pierre Boulez was the conductor. Pierre Boulez heard everything, everything in any type of music. He was known for being able to transcribe. Uh, he was being on an airplane and he would transcribe from memory the Rite of Spring, the entire score, you know, because that's who he was. You know, he was ridiculous. So, you know, I basically shed the Ligeti uh, for the rest of Wednesday, Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday morning, and then Wednesday we had a double, and then Thursday a, a dress, and then we played it Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, the only thing you can do besides practice your ass off is try and play that with conviction. Yeah. Um, and I, I'll be very honest, I did not nail it. There's no, I wasn't going to. Mm -hmm. But you know, at that moment, you just have to go, all right, I'm going down the hill. I am jumping off the cliff. I am, you know, I'm yeah. going, I'm, I'm jumping in this ocean. I mean, there's, you have no choice. Yeah. And so when you're faced with those situations, you know, it's, it's, it's fight or flight. And, um, you know, you, you just have to learn like, okay, I have to go all in on this. Um, and so, yeah, you, you have to kind of, you, you have to sell whatever it is you're, you're bringing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's true in life. You know, you have to sell what, what you, the goods you have to offer, yeah. uh, even if it's not perfect. Dude. Yeah. That's a great story. I mean, you either, when you're facing out pressures, I mean, it's your first year, so you must be feeling like the pressure, you know, like I better don't fall on my face on this thing. And then yeah. you either get paralyzed or you go for it, you know? Yeah, and, sounds... and for me, yeah, and sorry to interrupt, but for, for me, the, the great thing, you know, when I think about the experience in Chicago, it was, it was incredible because the principal uh, at that time, Gordon Peters, he put a lot of faith in me. Um, you know, as a, as a young player. And, and I was certainly hungry to take on anything he gave me. So, you know, then he, then he gave me xylophone on exotic birds with Boulez again. And man, that was, you know, a highlight of my, of my career, you know, being at the front of the stage and, and playing that part with, with Pierre Boulez conducting. And um, that gives you a lot of confidence when yeah. someone is, is putting their faith in you. Uh, and so when it was time to take the principal audition, I'm like, yeah, why not me? You know why? Why shouldn't I go for this? You know, I've mm -hmm. I've got I've got the confidence that that I can do it, and certainly there's other people that could do it as well or even better. But why not me? Yeah, and you got the experience, and then you got that job, and you kept that going in Chicago. Like I just want to highlight, you know, it's great hearing you talk about playing with conviction, being into it, getting getting really into the music. Like you know, I there's this YouTube thing of you playing bolero. And I don't think you know, you've never seen an orchestral percussionist play bolero the way you played it. I mean, you're rocking out in Carnegie Hall, right? And mm -hmm. so you did this in and out in your career, and then you left to pursue the band thing, right? And actually, I was, I heard you briefly, uh, you know, I was doing a little research before this talk, and I actually realized, I guess you were in a call yesterday with Eddie Meneses. Was that yesterday? 
Yeah. Yeah, it's really, you know, and um, so you were talking about, uh, like, you know, when you left Chicago, it was another fat tail you were pursuing. Have you heard of that, that uh, concept? Is a, is a statistic concept, the fat tail, right? Which is like really hard to make it in some of these music businesses, right? Like when you have an audition is this big event, improbable event that changes your life hugely, right? Winning Chicago Symphony or making it big as, as a band. And there's a lot of really good bands, you know, but these days with like Spotify and, you know, as much as the artists get, it's really tough to do it, right? So after Chicago, was there ever a time where you're like, oh my God, what did I do? This is too tough. Did you ever hit one of those moments that was like really tough? Yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah. I mean, you know, I can, I can, think, of a, I can think of a specific gig that we played in Hartford, Connecticut, and it was the four members of the band and the bartender. Hmm. <laughs> and, we were, and we were playing for the bartender. And, uh, you know, after you've driven, you know, 150 miles that day to get to the gig and you're, you've set up, you've been set up and you had your dinner and you're just going, yeah, I hope this is a good one tonight. And, you know, I can't, I hope we get some people and then, you know, no one shows up to the bar. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, there were plenty of nights like that in which you're just going, yeah, this is, uh, this is rough. Um, yeah. But, I mean, if you think about that in anything we do, um, you know, for athletes that, you know, their team's on a five-game losing streak, you know, self-doubt creeps in there, you know, even at the highest level. Um, if, you're, if you're in the practice room trying to prepare for an audition and you hit a wall, I mean, we hit walls every day in our, in our practice and in our lives. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I look back to that time and, and feel like it was, it was really living on the edge in the way that, you know, it was, it was hard and it was also really fulfilling when it went well. You know, when you had like, you know, 150 people like in the room, like rock into music that, that you wrote and you as a band like cultivated the sound of it and it, you could feel the energy of that. Um, so, yeah, the highs and lows were, were really extreme. And um, I guess, you know, I, I think if you're I was saying this to, to Eddie, because it's like I feel like I'm doing the book tour, you know, like I'm, yes. I'm doing all these interviews. <laughs> but but yeah, I think everything is. Um, we're taking risks in life. You know, everything that we, we choose to do is, is a risk. We don't know if we're going to make a career in, in music or, or in anything we endeavor to do, but you're playing your odds. And uh, yeah, to, to your point, it's like, yeah, I, I knew I was playing long odds in trying to quote unquote, make it as a band. But I think that was secondary to the, the need to do it um, the, the want to do it, to, to be expressive, to, to try and say something, um, you know, in the music that I was writing and that, that I was playing. And, and I still feel that today. So it, mm -hmm. it's one of the things besides being in the Chicago symphony, it's the thing, one of the things I'm most proud of is, is actually like taking the time and uh, to try and cultivate music and write my own music and perform it. Um, yeah, would I would I like to have you know played in big concert halls? Yes, absolutely. But uh, you know, didn't happen with my band. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. But I mean, you created you have this artistic input that I think many people wish they had. I mean, and you have this band that you're super proud of, and I think you guys have super cool songs, and you've touched some people. And uh, especially right now, as things are changing. I mean, your set of skills is really diverse. And as an artist, which I think many people wish they had it. And, you know, you're talking about this book tour you're going through, I guess. But it's like, <laughs> you know, it's because you're, you're relevant. You're doing these cool interviews with people, right? And then you're running good programs, good teaching programs, right? So yeah. it's kind of um, like, let's, what would you... Uh, suggest for like young musicians, right? Like you, de you develop this like broad range of skills, right? So what can young musicians take out of this, especially during this time, right? If you are really great at playing the timpani, tough luck. Right now, it's really, it's gonna be, you know, there's really not much you can do right now, right? Right. But you can do other things right now. You can go into your basement and write a cool song, you know, right ahead. Yeah. So what do you suggest for like, you know, young percussionists who are like, oh my God, I really want this orchestral thing. 
or yeah yeah it's um obviously you know right now uh, by the way you know sorry simone i'm, I'm also i'm doing the multitasking thing no again um, you ever see the show octonauts no i'm not no me neither we're, we're looking at uh we're looking at season two i don't think cool. you guys have seen this guys yeah we're i'm trying to get octonauts you haven't seen this right i think we would all agree on what a crazy and wonderful career ted has had and his creativity is actually kind of inspirational for all of us you know during this COVID 19 he's moved quickly going online and doing his taps festival so i encourage you guys to um check it out uh yeah i think that's a great example of family and career and andres i don't know if you uh logged in earlier but ted is just a crazy has had a crazy career you know he used to play in the chicago symphony then um he left to pursue his dreams to with his rock band with nico and now he's super active teaching he's been a great teacher like just he teaches at three at colburn Lincoln conservatory uh cal cal state uh, long beach and um you know i think he's a great example of having a multifaceted career so i still got 13 12 people here before uh dropping out but if you guys have any questions for me, let me know. Uh, other than that, uh, I hope to be, I, I see I have Pedro Fernandez here. We'll have Pedro soon in the show. I'm hoping next week. But if there are no questions, thanks for everyone watching. And uh, we'll catch you guys next week.